As I get started here, I just want to sort of give a background of uh, Turner. Um, as Keith said, we do roughly, and I'll say roughly, uh, $10 billion uh, volume annually, that is uh, internationally. So our headquarters is based in New York City, where I am based as well. We have over 40 offices in the US. Um, in New York alone, we do over $2 billion annually. So the BIM projects that I touch uh, covers roughly $2 billion um, a year. So um, I'm pretty busy, uh, to say the least. So just to give a general, a general background of who I am, uh, aside from Turner, my background is in the design industry. I'm, I'm a uh, trained architect. I have a master's degree in architecture. Uh, worked in the design field for roughly six years before I came to Turner. And um, one of the things that I, I like to touch on when I, when I talk about that is that uh, everything I did when I was designing buildings and thinking about how to create uh, a building was centered around the idea of 3D. There was nothing that we did that was strictly two-dimensional. It was always 3D, which then evolved into a smarter BIM environment. But um, anything from fabrication uh, directly from digital models to figuring out complex designs um, where you can have unique and, and interesting uh, buildings was something very uh, central to what I was sort of brought up on. So then uh, segueing into the construction industry, what I noticed was that there was, a, there was a gap. There was a gap between the collaboration between the design community, the construction community, and eventually the ownership community. And my interest was how do we start to bridge that gap and make information flow more freely across the team? That there was always this loss of information that happened um, when information exchanged hands. So three sort of overarching topics that I'm going to cover today in this brief amount of time is, one is setting the goals when embarking on a, on a BIM project. Um, define BIM, um, what are the expectations from the team, right? What are our goals? I think we all have common goals in the end, at the bottom line, but what are our intermediate goals along the way? Also procuring and standardizing BIM, very important to the process. How do we at Turner and how do we in the industry start to procure and standardize? And then lastly, capitalizing. Right, this is a business, we want to make sure we're executing properly, that we're giving value to our clients at the end of the day. So then also some, just some sort of random terms that come to mind, some keywords uh, that you can think of when, when we sort of start up a uh, BIM project. So setting the goals. Now, this chart sort of shows the total cost of ownership across the project lifecycle. And what's, what's interesting here is that is that 31% number that, that lies in the construction costs of the industry. Um, without looking at, at each of these individually, I think what's important here is that each of these parties that's, that's, that's focused on these individual pies of the chart doesn't, they, we don't always look across those lines to the other pieces of the chart. We're very concerned about our own piece of the pie, right? The problem is that we live in a world of silos. Architects, engineers, contractors, CMs, and owners, right? We're, it's a very siloed, and it, and, and it comes down to this sort of risk of sharing information that we're still stuck in the, and, and I sort of speak to the US model is that we're still stuck in a sort of contractual world where there is a big risk with sharing information, and we need to overcome this sort of silo domain of, of sharing information. So in looking at the sort of universe of BIM uses, as we would say, uh, this is probably just a short list of some of them that are out there. What's important here is that almost all of these are central to the idea of creating three-dimensional information first, and what are the benefits that you can reap after that? Some of these are not related to a three-dimensional model at all. But the ones that are, are sort of based around that idea of accurately representing the building first. And then what else can you do with that information downstream? I think there's a, there's a myriad of uses, and we have to sort of understand what those potentials are and how they help us. And it's not just about helping one of the parties on the project, but it's about helping everybody on the project. It's about how can we leverage the information that's created by one team to be used downstream by another. And so we look at the, the sort of um, this short list of uses and who's doing what over, over the time of the project, who's doing what and who's benefiting from that, from that information. And instead of just thinking about it in terms of building information modeling, we can start to think about it in terms of building information management systems. 
that it's more than just a model. It's actually how do we really think about controlling these buildings at the end of the day, that it's a living, breathing thing. It's, it's not just that 31% of the construction cost, right? It's that other 69% of everything else that goes into the project that we need to start to think about. We wanna close that loop. Information needs to flow freely across the team without keeping things too much to ourselves. You know, and all these things that sort of come across good and happy and great and they're sort of, we go out there and we can conquer the world, but we do need to be a little bit, uh, we need to be a little bit careful that, you know, now we have this excellent tool. Well, not everything is the nail, right? If we have this hammer, let's not just say, these are all these cool things that we can do, let's go do it. So the thing is, we don't wanna think about a solution looking for a problem, but the other way around, it's really a problem that needs to be solved. So what is the solution? And in many cases, BIM can be that solution. In many cases, BIM may not be that solution, but uh, we're finding that BIM can help solve many problems on the project if we understand exactly what that problem is. So this, this, uh, this chart, um, which starts to look at the, the law of diminishing returns on a project. So if we take a sort of strike a line um, uh, way to the left here, and we, and we say that the, the cost to do something on the project is very low, and you've done something good to raise the value of whatever that is, that's great, because it's cost you next to nothing, right? But that's gonna run out, right? I think we're all, um, we can all probably agree on that, that without an investment, usually the benefit is, uh, can, can dry up pretty quick. On the other end of the spectrum, too much investment, you know, you go for too much, the marginal benefit may not be there. I think the ultimate goal is that we always kind of want to be at this intersection of the marginal benefit and the marginal cost that we put into doing something. So the point being that there's always going to be an investment to undertake some technology like this. There's absolutely an investment, but that investment must be measured accurately to make sure that you're getting that, that benefit that you're expecting. And these curves, of course, don't, they're not static, they're dynamic. And we need to understand that, 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 that these are constantly changing. You need to sort of gauge that and keep, this is the importance of keeping some metrics on a project to sort of gauge the things that we've learned and what we're striving for. So the second part of this talk is uh, about procuring BIM. Um, every project we start off, off with uh, in terms of BIM starts with an execution plan really just the, the addendum to the contract that looks at who, who's doing what and when, how do we outline some of the technical aspects of how we're merging all of this valuable information together. Um, again, if we're, if we're going to do some 5D exercises in, sort of in terms of uh, extracting cost, um, putting together a four-dimensional schedule, uh, who is responsible for doing that as the main party, who's the secondary, who's the reviewer, all of these things we sort of outline very clearly. So everybody is, is very clear on what are the expectations at the end of the day. That my understanding, when I go into a BIM project, my assumptions that I'm making on that project are very different than the design team. They're also very different than what the owner might expect. So we try to really align all of those expectations across the entire team. Now, something that this might offer us is that in the old paradigm of sort of the standard paradigm of our milestones and, and how we issue documents and deliverables on a project is that we get to a certain point in the design, we issue documents, and then there's a loss of information that happens because, well, there's a, there's a number of factors, but let's say, perhaps, and this might be crazy, the project is over budget. So your project is X number of dollars over budget. We now need to trim back on the design, right, till the next set of documents and we work our way back up. So instead of this sort of rework and, and sort of keep go, stop, go, stop, we, start to, we can start to think about this rapid iterative process where the model becomes a working model, literally a working model that everybody can start to evaluate, communicate, collaborate clearly to gauge the progress of the job. So two main aspects. Um, what does the owner want to get out of the BIM process? And how do we break down those silos? Now, um, I put some links up here. This is for the, for the benefit of the recording. I probably missed about 30. I think, you, I think these guys have touched on some good ones as well. Um, 
So I want to touch on this last portion, and I, I would kind of be remiss if I didn't talk about any Turner projects. So this is my chance to sort of show off a little bit. Um, some of the metrics that we've captured over time in BIM projects versus non-BIM projects, you can see the, from a productivity standpoint, um, the BIM projects have done much better. Also, on a more detailed level, uh, and this is just looking at process and fabrication projects, but uh, the BIM projects certainly uh, help us save on schedule variance and, and change orders, um, MEP RFIs uh, compared to total RFIs. There's, there's a true um, outcome that we're seeing from the BIM projects that's, that's an advantage. Now, some, some things that we've done in the past, this is, uh, this is probably one of the hottest words of the day, 3D printing. Um, but we've used this to our advantage to communicate ideas uh, to our owners, to our subcontractors. This is a 3D print of a, of a curtain wall uh, detail on a project. And what's interesting about it is that it's color coded based on the different trades. So we can start to, we can put this on the table in a meeting with our subcontractors and look at the sequence of trades that need to come into that space and really talk about the complexity of what's involved in that. Because in, in the drawing set, that's not really apparent, the number of trades that are in that, in that uh, individual area. Secondly, our, our um, site safety review process with New York City uh, historically was a two-dimensional submission of a series of drawings. We collaborated with the New York City Department, and um, we came up with a solution where we can produce a two-dimensional set, embedding some 3D information into that. Um, some screen captures from the model, but taking it to the next step, we've actually been able to give them the model itself. So this model that we're submitting to them as, um, as a live three-dimensional model actually has a three-dimensional stamp in it of the reviewer's name. The reviewers can then come out to the site with their iPads. They can come review the models and verify that, that the crane is in the right spot, that the hoist is where we said it was, all the fencing is there. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, this is the regulatory agency that's, that's signing off on the, on the permit for the safety of the building. Uh, I close with this image, which in, in speaking about facilities management, this is a tool that we're currently working on, where it's taking a three-dimensional model and adding in the layer of uh, gauging performance of the building. So what's happening in the video, what you're seeing is that we're actually testing uh, four pieces of equipment that are tied to rooms, we can drop that into a, a chart that maps its performance over time. We can change that uh, period of time, whether it be on a weekly or monthly stage, we can start to check the trending data of, that, of those spaces. Now, um, one of the challenges in doing this is also making it very user-friendly. We want the end user to be able to use something like this. We don't want it to be this highly technological tool. So um, the end user can simply go through and click on this list on the right and, and see the various rooms in the model and these preset views so that it, it's very simple to use. You can sort of navigate your way through the model without having a sort of expert uh, um, running the model. Lastly, we see some, uh, some alarms going off on the roof. These are, these are simulated events, whether it's, a, whether it's a breakdown of the system, a filter needs to be changed, a motor. Um, we can map it back to the system that it's tied to. Right, so we see these dual alarms go off. Then we can take a look at, at other equipment on the roof that may need some uh, maintenance. And we can bring up the supporting documentation tied to that object. The shop drawing, there's a whole list of information that will be tied to that object. So that paper deliverable and the O&Ms that we give to our owners at the end of the day are no longer as relevant, that everything is sort of embedded in this one source, whether it be the specifications, the shop drawings. Um, or the uh, submittal data. So I sort of close on that, and I, and I just want to mention that, you know, Turner Construction itself, we don't really do any work here in Australia. We are a large, um, we are a large company, and we do have partners across the country. So Leighton, which is one of our sister companies, um, we tried to get some slides in here to sort of sh um, show some of their work, and, and in, in, the, in the end, it didn't truly really work out. But um, just wanted to give a mention that there are some great been things going on, uh, both with my colleagues who presented before me and also with, uh, with Leighton right here in Australia. So thank you.